Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. We're here to talk about the vaccination programme for 5 to 11 year olds. This was recommended by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation and Jersey's Children's Commissioner, Deborah McMillan, has also endorsed the programme. The vaccinators are experienced in childhood vaccination and have made Fort Regent especially welcoming for children. They've got a separate entrance and the Queen's Hall has a special area for them. We've had prepared a short video to show you what to expect. Now, while you're watching, it would be good if you could submit your questions via Slido. Just use hashtag AskTheExperts. Hi, my name is Ellie Rose. I'm going to show you what it's like to get the COVID-19 vaccine. You'll get your vaccine at the vaccination centre in Fort Regent. Your older sister or brother, mum, dad, grandparents or carers might have already had their vaccine. The vaccine helps protect you from catching COVID and make sure you don't feel too poorly if you do catch it. Once you're inside Fort Regent, you will need to follow the colourful signs going to the children's 5 to 11 entrance. After you've gone through, someone will ask your parent or carers for a signed permission form. If your parent or carers have not filled in the permission form yet, they will be given one to complete in the cafe. After handing in the permission form, you'll be asked to sit down with your parent or carers in the waiting area. It will only be a very short wait and you'll soon be called forward to a desk where the team will ask your parent or carers a few questions. If you have any questions, don't forget to ask. The staff are very friendly and happy to answer any questions you have. You'll then be able to go into a pod with your parent or carers and get your COVID-19 vaccine. This will be given as an injection. Don't worry, it doesn't hurt. It will just feel like a little scratch on your arm. It will be over quickly as it only takes a few seconds. You will then be given a sticker for getting the vaccine. Sometimes after getting the vaccine, you can get a sore arm or feel a little bit unwell. This is perfectly normal and it won't last long. It's a sign that your body is learning how to protect itself against COVID-19. Being vaccinated will help to protect you, your family and the community. Well, we've already had feedback from some parents saying how welcoming the whole vaccination experience has been for their children. So thanks to the team for working hard to create a friendly atmosphere. Now let's introduce our expert panellists. Today we've got consultant paediatrician, Dr. Suzanne Luck. Dr. Ivan Muscat, Deputy Medical Officer for Health. And Emma Baker, Head of Vaccination Programme. I'm afraid Rob Sainsbury was intending to come. He heads up children, young people, education and skills, but unfortunately he can't now attend. But let's get on with the questions. First of all, I think we've got a question that many people will be either thinking about or worrying about. Is this vaccine safe for children who are as young as 5 to 11? Shall we start with Dr Muscat? Uh, the, the short answer is yes, the vaccine is safe. If it were not safe, it would not have been authorised by the uh, MHRA, by the European Medicines Agency, by CDC in the United States, by Health Canada, and by all the other authorities across the jurisdictions in all five continents. Um, of course, very importantly, uh, vaccine safety needs to be measured uh, and balanced against vaccine efficacy. And the vaccine is very safe indeed. And the benefits of, of vaccination, even in young children who tend to get less severe disease than uh, older people uh, still very much favour their use because the risk benefit ratio is very much in favour of using them in 5 to 11 year olds, 12 to 15 year olds and so on. Um, so the, the vaccine is safe, although it's less severe disease in younger children, uh, there are also fewer side effects in younger children. Uh, so that balance remains in favour of vaccination. Thank you. Um, Dr. Luck, do you have anything to add to that? I know you, you see a lot of children in your work, don't you? Yeah, I mean, just really to support um, what Ivan's saying that um, although it's generally a milder disease, it does still sometimes cause hospitalizations. And in the, the UK and sort of larger countries in Jersey, there have been deaths related to COVID. And um, it's a safe vaccine, otherwise it wouldn't be approved. And there's now many millions of doses being given in other continents in this age group, and um, it's closely monitored and the side effects are still time and time again shown to be less than the effects of getting the disease itself, otherwise it wouldn't be approved. Okay, thanks. Um, just to remind 
everybody who's watching, if you go onto Slido and see some questions that you'd like and you'd like answered, if you give them a like, give them a thumbs up, they will start going up to the top of the priority list and we can ask those rather than other questions which are coming in. So if we move on to something a bit more kind of specific now, can you confirm what the time gap needs to be between testing positive for COVID and the children then receiving the vaccine? I think, Emma, you could probably answer this one. Um, so there's an interval of 12 weeks between testing positive for COVID um, and then being able to receive your vaccination. Um, it has been brought to my attention that there has been a slight technical issue um, with our booking system. Um, so I do apologise for any inconvenience that's been caused for any parents that may have attended the vaccination centre. Um, the, the, the information leaflets that have been sent to, um, to, to parents and to carers um, and our website, they do confirm that it is the 12 week time interval. Okay, thanks Emma. That's quite clear. Now, somebody has got a slightly different way of asking, is the, is the vaccine safe? They're saying it's proven that COVID has 0% risk to healthy children, whereas vaccines cannot be given with 0% risk, as this vaccine has no long-term safety data. Surely it would be best to wait. Is that one for you, Dr Muscat? I can start off. Um, uh, the so. COVID, as Suzanne was uh, saying, uh, is uh, not 0% risk to children. It does cause illness and it can cause severe illness, which can result in hospitalization and uh, on occasion admission to ITU. Um, so it is not of 0% risk. Uh, preventing uh, COVID is uh, by far uh, the better way forward. And of course, preventing even mild disease means that children can continue to uh, attend school, can continue with their day-to-day lives in the usual way, uh, and can continue to grow up, uh, if you like, uh, in a normal fashion. Um, the uh, vaccine uh, reduces severe disease, it reduces infection rates, and allows children to live a much more uh, straightforward and normal life. I don't know if Suzanne wants to add to that. Yeah, again, not, not a lot really to add to that. But yeah, I mean, certainly hospitalisations, we've seen healthy kids hospitalised with COVID. Um, yes, it's a much milder illness, thank goodness for us as paediatricians, but it, it, it's not a 0% risk at all. And as we were saying before, yeah, the, the, the vaccine side effects are still less even than the mild disease that you get with COVID. So the way forward and, yeah, the, 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 the data suggests that we should should be vaccinating this age group now. It's also worth adding that the, it's always a balance of the risk benefit ratio. So in uh, uh, adults and older people, the risk of disease and the risk from disease is greater, but the side effect uh, uh, risk from vaccination is, is a bit higher as well. So we have about two to five yellow cards being sent into the MHRA per thousand doses for adults. Uh, when you come to uh, children under the age of 16, the, uh, uh, the risk from COVID and of, uh, as a result of COVID is less, but the yellow card rate is also less at about one per thousand vaccines. So, so the, 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 everything is lower in children, but the balance is still very much in favor of vaccination things come up on the yellow card does it go as minor as my arms a bit sore or does the yellow card scheme only accept more serious side effects the yellow card scheme is designed to mop up every reported side effect however minor uh, it is then and and which is what makes it such a powerful tool because it uh, uh, nets in everything that can possibly be seen and reported it is then up to the uh, experts in the MHRA to distill out what is a signal from that mass of information that they have and what uh, may, as a result of being a signal, uh, have a cause-effect relationship with the vaccine. Can I just add that um, anybody can report um, a yellow card as well, so it's open for the public to be able to report any, um, if they feel they've got any potential side effects, um, like medical practitioners, practitioners can also refer into that too. 
So how do people do that? Do you just Google yellow card? What, what, how do you find it? Yeah, so you could Google yellow card submission um, or if you're coming for a vaccination at the, at the Fort Regent, um, we also provide information leaflets um, and that's detailed on those information leaflets too. And they, they want to know even if you, your arm's sore because that's quite common with vaccines, isn't it? I wouldn't bother reporting that personally. So I think if, if individuals feel that they've got um, a potential side effect then, then they f and they feel they should report that, then we would encourage them to. Okay. So moving on to the next question. And remember to like them if you want them asked. Now somebody said, I've heard about heart problems with this vaccine and children. How big is that risk? They don't say where they've heard about it. Is there anybody like, who would like to go first with that one? Um, so again, this needs to be put in the perspective of COVID. Uh, the, uh, the risk of myocarditis uh, with viral infections in the absence of COVID or COVID vaccination is about 10 to 20 uh, cases per 100,000 per year. Um, and, and that is in almost entirely viral. Um, uh, with, in COVID years, uh, that risk goes up to, up to about 150 per 100,000 per annum. Uh, so it is significantly greater. Uh, the point of uh, that, of course, is that COVID is a virus. If there's a lot of that around, then it can cause myocarditis itself. The risk of uh, myocarditis uh, from vaccination is present. It's of the order of about 10 per million doses on average. Uh, if, uh, per, if you then look at the rate in uh, children, uh, in five to 11 year olds, it's estimated to be about three per million doses. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, 12 to 15 year olds, it is higher. It starts to approach about 10 per million doses. Um, so that is uh, significantly less than the risk uh, of getting myocarditis due to COVID. But it is not just the numerical difference that's important here. What is very much more important in many ways is that viral myocarditis can be very severe. 80% uh, of people with viral myocarditis, be it COVID or another virus, uh, will recover completely, and that's absolutely fantastic. But 20% don't, and 5% go on to transplantation or unfortunately don't uh, recover. That's with viral myocarditis. Uh, with COVID vaccine associated myocarditis, uh, everyone uh, to date has recovered. Uh, it causes a mild, usually self-limiting illness. Sometimes you may need some anti-inflammatory medication or similar to help you over it, but people recover from it and don't have any long-term side effects or uh, from, from the vaccine-related myocarditis. So it is vaccine myocarditis is less common and not severe, less severe than with viral myocarditis. Okay, thank you, Dr. Muscat. Um, the JVC have stated that we are now in an endemic situation. So why vaccinate for something that's like a common cold? Would you vaccinate your own children? What do you think, Emma? As a mum, yes, I would want to protect um, for, for my children, so I would um, have them vaccinated and have them. Is the pandemic, has, that, has it been changed to an endemic? I haven't heard that. Neither have I. Um, I th the WHO, who are it's the them, only it's people... It's them that kind of set that, isn't it? It, only WHO can determine whether something is a pandemic or not. They have labelled COVID a pandemic and haven't removed that label yet. But it is true that the uh, um, very emergency nature of COVID is starting to, to wilt. We are moving away from the need for an, from, for an emergency response to, response to COVID to finding a way where we can live our lives normally with COVID. We're on that pathway. We're on the pathway towards normality. We haven't got there yet, but we are on that road. And, and we are on that road uh, because of the vaccination programme, uh, the extensive vaccination programme that has been rolled out uh, in Europe and many other countries. Dr Luck, would you be happy to say whether or not you'd get your children vaccinated? Yeah, I am. I'm going to be encouraging mine, of course. It's, um, you know, the, the, the data 
speaks for itself and yeah the best way to protect my kids and to help them to continue having as normal life as possible after all the disruption they've had is to get them vaccinated so yeah I will be. Because 11 year olds can have their own views can't they? They can have their own <laughs> views and um, yeah I mean it's our duty as parents with many with any views our, our children young people have isn't it to, think, to encourage them to make good decisions so yeah my, my kids are frightened of having the, the jab and you know it being a bit painful but um, that's something that I support them through just like you know if they're frightened about sitting exams or doing anything else that they have to do and uh, it's just a case of supporting them through it. Okay um, I don't know if you know this figure but how many children have been hospitalized with COVID-19? I, I assume the person who's asking is interested in in Jersey if we have a figure for that or a rough figure. Yeah, so you're saying we've, I mean, we've, we've seen a handful of children of, in this age group, um, very, very few. Um, but, you know, one, one is more than I'd like to see. Um, you know, they often need support with their breathing or, you know, oxygen in particular. And, um, yeah, and we have had um, kids admitted with that, but, but not many, thank, thankfully. Okay. This next question, uh, is there enough data collected to show how the vaccine affects menstrual cycles? And how do we know that this won't affect young girls? Is there something, has there been a study into that? I think, Dr. Muscat, you know the, about this? The yellow card system uh, uh, comes to the fore in this, in, the, in, the, in this type of question as well. So uh, they have received about 38,000 uh, reports of uh, changes in the menstrual cycle from uh, about 71 million uh, women who ha have been vaccinated and, and who, who are of the right age, of course. Um, and they, they, uh, they feel that uh, this is, there's no increased frequency of uh, uh, changes in cycle to what one would normally expect on a sort of, uh, in the absence of vaccination, the, the menstrual cycle is affected by uh, stress, by infection, by intercurrent illnesses. Um, uh, so so it, is, it is entirely reasonable to expect it to be either affected coincidentally when you're having a vaccine or to be affected by the reactogenicity to the vaccine. In other words, if you're feeling a bit off color with a fever and so on as a result of the vaccine, that may affect your cycle. But it is very, it is transient and there's no evidence whatsoever that it has any long-term effect. Neither is there any evidence uh, that uh, uh, it can affect future menstrual cycles in women and children, girls who have not yet started to menstruate. And I guess if we're looking at young women who haven't been menstruating for very long, cycles are fairly irregular a lot of the time anyway, so I'm, I'm yes. assuming it'd be quite hard to tell whether that exactly. irregularity would be due to a vaccine or just because they're young. Co co the coincidence uh, is likely to be great. Okay, here's another question. My children have had COVID recently and they weren't particularly unwell. Could you explain the benefits to them of having a vaccination now? There definitely is a benefit. So uh, the, the, uh, if you get uh, infection due to the virus, you will develop immunity to that virus if you're immune competent, and that is really very helpful indeed. But getting vaccinated on top of that broadens and heightens your immune response and uh, f renders you even more protected against future viruses, especially future variants. The type of immune response you get as a result of the combination of natural infection and vaccination, that hybrid immunity, is the best form of immunity you can get. So absolutely, we do uh, recommend that if you've had natural COVID infection, you still go ahead and get vaccinated at an appropriate interval afterwards. And does the vaccine last long, that the immunity from the vaccine, does it last longer than the immunity you get from having COVID? Um, this depends on the difference between the virus or vaccine and subsequent variants. So if the variants that you are going to see in the future are significantly different to what you've had before, then there is a more rapid waning of immunity to both the vaccine and, and, and as a result of the natural infection you've had in the past. So uh, as a result of that, we are seeing more people uh, get reinfection with Omicron 
when they've had infection in the past because Omicron is significantly different to the uh, Alpha and Delta uh, variants that we've had in the past. But the, the, if you've had fact, uh, natural infection, it is definitely worthwhile having vaccination on top of that. It puts you uh, uh, in a much stronger position. And we don't know what's around the corner. So being, putting yourself in a strong position now is, is, is very sensible. I'm not sure who would be best to answer this one. After the initial full doses, how many and what frequency of boosters are being proposed? This is for the children, five to 11 year olds. Would that be something for you to answer, Emma? Um, yeah, I can, I can try to answer that. Um, so the, the JCVI, which are the, um, the UK Committee of Experts of Vaccination, um, continuously analyze the data, global data, um, to, and they, they look at the, the benefits and potential risks of vaccination. Um, and then they will um, analyze the, the, the global data um, and they will make their recommendations. Um, so, so does that involve seeing how long their immunity lasts and doing tests like that to see yeah, when so they need boosters? They'll, they'll look at immunity levels, um, at the effectiveness, um, and then they'll, uh, they'll look at all the different, the different benefits and, and potential um, risks, and then they make their recommendations from there. Okay, so we need to wait for that. And that boosting, I think they are offering boosters, aren't they, in kids in special risk groups as well. I think I'm right in saying, is that right? So if, you're, if your child is a, has got an underlying condition that puts them in a higher risk group and there's a, a number of conditions that cause that, I think, I think there's a booster being proposed. Yeah. I think I'm right. Okay. Does natural immunity not mean anything mm. nowadays? For something that is weakening, i.e. COVID, I don't know if it's weakening, but um, it's changing, isn't it? Why risk kids' health on data that isn't there? Um, natural immunity does mean something nowadays, as it always has, but we do know that uh, the virus does change, uh, immunity does wane, um, and uh, adding uh, vaccine-driven uh, immunity on top of natural immunity most certainly uh, improves the immune protection of an individual and improves that protection uh, not just against extant variants but future variants. It both heightens immunity and broadens immunity, which is why vaccine-derived uh, immunity in addition to natural immunity is recommended, why vaccination is recommended on top of any past COVID infection you may have had. What kind of comments have you had, Emma, at the vaccine centre so far from parents bringing their children? I know we've had some feedback saying how welcoming and child-friendly it is. Yeah, we've, we've received lots of positive feedback so far um, from parents and carers that have brought their children along. And we've had some positive feedback from the, from the children as well. Um, we've tried to make it as welcoming and as friendly as we can do. Um, there's a dedicated, air, there's a, a, a dedicated stream for, um, for families when they're coming along with their 5 to 11 year olds. Um, and we have a dedicated section within the Queen's Hall, um, which we've tried to make as um, child friendly as we can do. OK, another question about vaccines. Who takes responsibility if my child has a vaccine-related injury? I'm assuming injury might be a bit wider than that, maybe side effect? Yeah, um, so if there's um, any potential um, uh, any potential severe reactions to any vaccinations, um, then we would um, encourage the individuals to um, see their medical practitioner for an assessment. Um, if it was in an emergency, obviously to call a, an emergency um, response, so from 999 um, um, for, for review and assessment. And then they would be treated for whatever the side effect is, presumably. And then they maybe report it to the yellow card system? Yeah, so they can be reported to the yellow card system. Okay. If my child is 11, is it better to wait until they turn 12 to get the same dose as older children? Do you want to ask that, answer that one, Dr. Luck? I, I can do it. It's, it's, a, it's a common question because obviously that can mean just a small, small difference. But I mean, the dose that's being proposed is, is smaller, but it's still, um, you know, the data suggests it's effective still. And the advice at the moment is to just get your child vaccinated as soon as possible. They should still mount a response and, um, yeah. 
it sh they should should be protected as soon as they can is the advice at the moment. So do it now, even if they're going to be 12 in a month. Yeah, and then and then they're ready for sort of going up to to, to older school and um, it's all done. Um, but the, the, the dose is effective and it's a lower dose and um, yeah, side effects from the lower dose are possibly a little bit less. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's no rationale in leaving it. They should still mount an immune response and better to get that immunity as soon as possible. Okay. Now here's a practical one for Emma. We're away over the Easter holidays. Can my child get vaccinated during school term? Are you still going to be doing it then? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we've launched the program um, in, to coincide with the Easter holidays because it may um, it have a sort of, uh, less effects on sort of schooling, etc. Um, but they're absolutely welcome to come along um, after the school holidays too. Um, and we're also open on a Saturday if that's more convenient um, for parents to bring their children along. So it's op they're open after school times and... Yes, so we're open until 6.30 in the evenings for, for appointments um, okay. and we're also open on a Saturday too. Okay, great. Well, that's easy. What are the risks if I don't vaccinate my child? Dr Muscat, I mean, you've sort of talked about that from the other angle. You've said why we should be yeah. vaccinated. What happens if we don't get vaccinated? Well, then... Uh People who are not vaccinated are more prone to get infection. Uh, people who are not vaccinated are more prone to get severe infection when they, if they were to get infection. Um, and that severe infection uh, can uh, lead to hospitalisation. I completely accept, of course, that children are less likely to develop severe infection. That, that's absolutely correct. Uh, but nonetheless, they can develop severe infection. Um, the side effects of vaccination in children are less than in adults, and we've talked about the balance still being in favour of vaccination in children. Uh, the, it is thought, uh, based on sort of uh, large uh, databases, that uh, 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 vaccination um, uh, will prevent something like uh, 130 uh, hospital admissions per million doses. Um, and uh, that is what is being prevented by vaccination in addition to, of course, keeping pe children um, healthy and allowing them to continue uninterrupted uh, uh, with their education and their day-to-day -day lives. So uh, it, it prevents infection and severe infection and allows children to, to just get on with their lives. Okay, and I guess even though most children don't get it severely, you never know which child will. That's absolutely true. What are the advised waiting times between having COVID and getting vaccinated? So for five to 11 year olds, if you test positive for COVID and have a positive PCR result, um, then there's an interval of 12 weeks until you can have um, your next vaccination. Is that the same as adults? No, it's different for oh. adults. Right. So that's for five to 11 year olds. Okay. My children have had their other normal childhood vaccinations. Is the COVID vaccine going to be part of this now? I'm not sure whether to get my children vaccinated as they were fine when they had COVID. That's two things really, isn't it? I mean, that's, they were lucky because they weren't severely infected, but is COVID vaccine going to be part of normal childhood vaccinations? It's difficult to say at the moment uh, what uh, the programme for future COVID vaccination holds. Um, at the moment, we are still looking at what happens to people's immunity after vaccination in light of the variants that are coming along and whether boosters are needed and if they are needed for what age group or for what group of people with comorbidities. So we are still feeling our way forward in terms of what type of program or, uh, we will require uh, to combat COVID going forward. It's entirely possible that like flu, it will be uh, a yearly booster, but we will have to wait and see. We're still uh, working that out. Um, if uh, it does uh, come to be a yearly vaccine, 
um, then uh, quite how it is administered has also to be seen. There are a number of different uh, avenues that are being explored to make uh, the delivery of the COVID vaccine uh, simpler, easier, and uh, less uh, pain-free in the sense that it can possibly be given not by injection but through other routes. Um, because children's flu vaccines are nasal sprays, aren't they? Yes, they are. I'm not suggesting that the COVID vaccine will be a, a nasal spray necessarily, but a number of different routes are being explored. People are exploring the use of an oral vaccine uh, covering both COVID and flu, and there are trials going on in England, at, in the UK, sorry, uh, at the moment. Uh, there are trials in Australia looking at uh, an elastoplast with minuscule uh, um, needles uh, which you don't feel which inject the the covid uh, uh, just under the skin and elicit a much greater immune response and so on and so forth so people are constantly looking at not just the scheduling of vaccination but at making the vaccination process even more user friendly and more effective um, i can't tell you exactly what, what the future holds, except that it will be a safe and effective vaccine that will be used going forward as is now. Um, in terms of the second part of the question, uh, and as I've said before, um, if you've had natural COVID infection in the past, then uh, adding to that by being vaccinated, which broadens and heightens your immune response, is the better way forward. Dr. Luck, one for you, I think. How is the paediatric vaccine for children different from the vaccine everybody else gets? Yeah, well, it's the same vaccination, but just a smaller dose that's been tested in that age group. So it's exactly the same preparation, smaller volume, I think it is as well, isn't it, to the um, adult dose. So it'll be um, less uncomfortable than giving them a, a, a big big volume into their little arms but essentially it's the same vaccine pretty similar side effect profile but as we've already said actually probably a better side effect pro uh, profile and some of the evidence is that most of the side effects are experienced less by children when they get that vaccine okay will children be treated the same in schools and hospital environments if they choose not to have the vaccine or will they be pressured by yourselves the medical profession i guess are you going to pressure children? So there's no pressure on anybody. This is an offer for vaccination um, and everybody will still be treated the same. We, we're here to provide a, a safe vaccination service um, and to provide care as parents and children um, with all the information that they need, the evidence-based information, so they can make those informed decisions. And is that the same in the hospital? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's certainly no reason that we'd be excluding patients. And, you know, I, I personally, as a paediatrician, will be taking the approach I take with any vaccines. We'll probably ask patients and parents if they've had it because it might affect the sort of illnesses we think children might be getting. Um, and, I, and I generally make sure that parents have, have received up-to-date and, um, you know, information, good information on which to make an informed decision. Um, but, yeah, definitely no pressure. I'm getting my children vaccinated, but I wondered why children generally don't get COVID as badly as older people get it. Dr. Um, Muscat? Part of the reason, and uh, a large part of the reason, uh, is uh, that um, children in the main are healthier and don't have comorbidities. Um, uh, and if you look at all the various age groups, then the uh, comorbidities, the number of comorbidities that people have increase with age. The uh, type of response they have uh, is, is perhaps less uh, agile than that of a, of a child. Um, and uh, is that, yes. And comorbidities uh, are other health conditions. Indeed. Um, thank you. That, that yeah, is exactly what, what I meant. Knows what yeah, no, no, sorry. Means. That's th thank you. I'm used, I'm used to you saying right. it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, uh, but that's uh, absolutely right. So, um, children with comorbidities, with coincident conditions, uh, do unfortunately fare uh, less well with COVID than uh, children of the same age without those uh, concomitant conditions. So, so uh, the, the, the presence of ad additional uh, illnesses in an individual 
uh, which are of course more common with age, uh, does make a big difference to how you respond to COVID infection. And to the extra boosters for older people. When Indeed. They kind of, we start at the older age, don't we? Yes. Okay, here's somebody who's probably got children that have had COVID a few times. With so many children having already had COVID, is there any point in vaccinating them? Again, I think it's uh, your, your answer from before, isn't it? Yes, again, you broaden and heighten your immune response to COVID if you add vaccination to natural immunity. Um, and that puts you in a stronger position in relation to future variants of COVID and indeed current variants as well. Does, does broadening and heightening the immune response mean that rather than just being useful for that one bit of Omicron that you had, that it kind of works on other wider variants? Yes, indeed. That is exactly what I mean. So apart from uh, increasing, if you like, the height of, of or the strength of your immune response to the variant that you've seen, you also uh, expand the repertoire of uh, antibodies and uh, other immune systems uh, uh, against um, uh, different uh, variants, if you like, of, of, of COVID. Unless so the variants change radically, but... If the, if the variants change hugely, then of course that's a different matter. But if they change uh, to the type of extent that we've seen them change so far, then you're in a better position. Okay. Um, are there any long-term side effects of the vaccine? Have we seen any of those? Uh, the, well, I think the, the, we can generalize based on other vaccines. So uh, when you have side effects uh, from vaccines that have been with us for very many years, if not decades, then we know that the side effects we see from those vaccines uh, if seen, are going to be seen very shortly after the vaccination. Not nothing, and then years later you see a, a side effect. That is not the way side effects work with vaccines, and there's absolutely no reason to believe otherwise with COVID vaccination. COVID vaccination has now been with us um, since uh, December uh, 20, January 21, M more than 10 billion doses have been given worldwide across all age groups from above the age of six months to above the age of 90 across all ethnic groups. We've got a wealth of experience with COVID vaccination. Obviously, we haven't got a large number of years behind us, but we do have a large number of years behind the other vaccines. And we know that with all the other vaccines, if you are going to get a, long, a side effect, it's going to be in the immediate aftermath of the vaccine rather than years later. So there's no reason to believe there are going to be long-term side effects from COVID vaccination. But you've said the f side effects happen immediately after the vaccine, but do they last for a long time? Because I think that's what they're asking. Do these side effects last for a long time? The, uh, so that's, yes. Um, so uh, depending on the side effect, then uh, it may be that some will linger on for a number of months. Uh, and uh, if uh, uh, you happen to have uh, a serious side effect, uh, for example, a thrombotic episode, that that can leave a long-term uh, effect. Uh, but um, the uh, frequency of those uh, uh, serious events is extremely low. And this frequency of serious events due to COVID, uh, on the other hand, is uh, e extremely high. Uh, potentially. So, for example, uh, in the United uh, Kingdom, they've given more than 150 million doses of vaccine. Um, the, there have been uh, a total of 86 deaths attributed to the vaccine, uh, but there have been uh, a total of about 150,000 uh, deaths attributed to COVID over that two-year period. And it is estimated that the vaccination has prevented 60,000 deaths due to COVID in the United Kingdom. Uh, so the, you must always, in thinking about the safety of vaccine, think about uh, the benefits that vaccine is bringing about and weigh the benefits of the vaccine against the possible side effects of the vaccine. And if you don't do that, you are not uh, going to be 
able to come to a ri the, the right conclusion about whether a vaccine is appropriate or not. Right. Now, this might be one for you, Emma. Will the vaccine for this age group be given in schools at any point? Because lots of vaccines are given in schools, aren't they? Yeah, so currently at the moment, um, there's no immediate plans to deliver um, this COVID vaccination to this age group in schools. Um, but in the background at the vaccination centre, we're continuously monitoring the footfall that's coming through the centre um, and looking at ways that makes the vaccine um, most accessible um, for, um, for, for individuals to be vaccinated. Um, so we're continuously looking at different ways and which could be better um, for, for individuals. Um, uh, yeah, so... We'll, we'll keep monitoring. OK. How long does it take until the vaccine starts to work in this age group? We're going on holiday and we want to make sure the children get it when they will benefit from it the most. It's a nice practical question. Who would know about that? Is, is that Dr Luck, Dr Muscat? Yeah, it's normally within sort of a couple of weeks, isn't it? It's two exactly. weeks is the two maximum e e efficacy. Um, but, you know, before then there will be some benefits. So... Um, uh, it starts working fairly quickly, but it, it, you know that you've got immunity generally from two weeks onwards. Yeah, because that was what we had to have had the vaccine more than two weeks before we went on holiday when we were having to show those certificates everywhere we went, mm. isn't it? So I guess that's... Yeah. So two weeks. Will COVID vaccinations ever be given to babies? That's quite a lot younger than five. There are trials going on in the United States at the moment looking at COVID vaccinations. Uh, in uh, children aged six months to four years. But I don't know what's, what's going to become a, a, a normal programme yet. You know, it may, the trials are there, but whether they actually then go on to introduce it as a, as, a, as a routine vaccine, I don't know. It may not be appropriate uh, because it is of no, of much more limited value, or it may be appropriate. We'll have to see what the trial results uh, say and, and what, what the various authorities think about it. And of course, we're giving babies what we call passive immunisation through immunising pregnant mums. mums. Um, and there's been a lot of advances in that recently. Everyone used to be frightened of vaccinating pregnant mums and giving them vaccinations. We now know with other infections like whooping cough, that actually is a really good strategy, giving the mums the vaccination and they have a really good immune response and they pass those antibodies on through breastfeeding. Well, even before birth, but then through breastfeeding afterwards. So we are kind of vaccinating the babies through keeping their mums healthy. Mm. Okay. The, uh, the, but as, as uh, uh, Suzanne implies, the vaccine, the, the protection transmitted by mum to baby uh, wanes and, and starts to wane significantly from six months, which is why you'd want to vaccinate babies older than six months because that vaccination is not interfered with by any passive transmission of immunity from the mum. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, if you vaccinate the mum and then you go on to vaccinate the baby after six months of age, the baby is covered completely. Um, and that's precisely what happens with pertussis vaccination. Um, whether this is what will happen in the future with COVID that's vaccination off, depends... Yeah? Yes, pertussis. sorry. Uh, um, Full of with, jargon, Dr Muscat. Um, um, <laughs> Yes, I'll, 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 I'll remember to avoid that. <laughs> OK. Um, is it only Pfizer that children are given? Currently, it's the paediatric formulation of the um, Pfizer vaccine that's been um, approved for use. Um, so it's been through all the studies um, that, to make sure that it's, it's safe and effective, um, a safe and effective vaccine. So that's the one that we're currently using. OK. Will the government start to publish the statistics of adverse events due to the COVID vaccine for the next two years, like they have with COVID infection statistics? This comes back to the yellow card system. It's more of a national thing, isn't it? The, yes. Um, and, reporting and, of yeah. this. And, and so the, the yellow card system is designed, as we were saying earlier on, to mop up as many uh, observations as possible to permit um, uh, uh, the ability to pick up even small signals. Um, in, uh, again, to come back to numbers, and I apologize for this, but they do speak volumes. Um, in, in the United Kingdom, they've had coming up to a million yellow card reports, uh, and that is a wealth of information. 
uh, which allows them to sift out what is coincidence, which is the vast majority of them, what is minor, like a sore arm, and what is serious, which, is, uh, need, which needs to be looked at, especially if uh, there is a true signal and especially if there is a cause uh, effect mechanism there. So can if we see these statistics? Are they online somewhere? They are online. You just look up MHRA yellow card system and you can okay, see so the statistics there. So if people can find out these statistics and indeed, what the reports are. Absolutely. And if you were if we were to this if, if proportionately in Jersey we would only have gleaned some five hundred to a thousand yellow cards um, compared with the UK. And that number is very small indeed uh, and won't allow us to see small signals. And additionally, it requires trying to create a cause-effect uh, link, which is very difficult with small numbers and, of course, requires a lot of expertise and time, which we don't have uh, either. So collecting large numbers in the UK... That, uh, including the Jersey... Inc no, absolutely, no, including anything. Jersey and, and, all the, uh, and, and the Isle of Man and Guernsey and so on, is the best way forward by far and away because it is much more sensitive and they have the wherewithal to tease out uh, what is uh, a, a significant side effect if one is seen. Okay. Now remember to ask your questions on Slido if you've got questions that haven't come up yet. And if you see a question you like, give it a like, thumbs up sign, and it will shoot to the top. So the next one that's at the top is from somebody who says, I've had all my vaccines and I'm very supportive of vaccinations for adults. But as a parent with a six-year-old child, I'm on the fence about whether or not to get my child vaccinated. What would you say to reassure someone like me? Dr Luck, what would you say to a parent who was concerned about that if you were seeing them in your surgery? Yeah, well, it's, um, it, it's still the best way to stop your kid getting severe COVID infection. And I can appreciate, you know, we've been saying as paediatricians, you know, it is a mild infection and, and thank goodness, you know, it's been affecting adults much more. But we know from the data, you know, the, 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 um, the vaccine bodies wouldn't be recommending it as something that's worth spending money on if we didn't know that actually the, the risk uh, well, the benefit outweighed any risk to the kids. So, you know, still, but the, the best way to have a mild infection and, and to be able to have long, as um, Dr. Muscat said, the sort of broad protection against what other forms of um, COVID might emerge is, is to get that vaccine. Now, you mentioned data. I think I saw somebody asking earlier, where can they find the data that you referred to? Both of you said there's lots of data from all around the world about the efficacy of the vaccine and the safeness of the vaccine. Is there somewhere online that people could read that data? The WHO website's quite good, isn't it, at summarising? Yeah. So um, the World Health Organisation has lots of information, so that might be a place to go. Uh, and CDC has a lot of uh, yeah. information. Control, JCVI, that, that's the Centers for Disease Centre Control. Disease, which that's is, the American which is, one, isn't that's it? That's the United you States. Know, yeah. uh, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, equivalent, if you like, of the, what used to be Public Health England. Um, um, so that, that site is very helpful. Health Canada is very helpful. Um, uh, the uh, JCVI, if you Google JCVI COVID vaccination, you'll find data there. If you Google UK HSA COVID vaccination, you'll find information there. Um, it, it is readily available on the net. Okay. Some reading to do then. Now, what are the long-term plans for vaccinating children? Will this need to be administered, administered every year for life? Well, it's kind of what we don't know yet, isn't it? Yes, uh, we, will ha we have to see what's what, what's what, 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 what um, the studies that people are continually undertaking reveal in terms of what the programme of vaccination should be. And, and I, I can't really go beyond that at the minute. And also, I guess it might depend on what COVID does in terms of... <coughs> becoming less virulent or staying the same or less infectious, what variants happen? All, all, all that is unknown. Yeah. Okay. All my kids have been really upset after having had jabs in the past. What support is available at the centre to help? Emma, so, I'm sure you, you seem like a very supportive person. So we've got an incredibly experienced team of vaccinators at the fort um, that will guide parents and carers and their children through, through the journey of being vaccinated. Um, we've tried to make that environment that we have as welcoming in as possible, um, to make it as child-friendly as possible. 
Um, and that's, it's, it's another reason why we're vaccinating at, at the fault um, as opposed to in the schools at the moment, because we understand that children of that age want to have their parents there and parents and carers want to be there with their children as well. Um, so by having an opportunity to come along together at the fort um, and then we can support them and give them the information um, that, that they require to make those informed decisions. And it's not going to be like kind of scary going to a doctor in, from days of yore. You've got people who can talk to children in a way that children can yeah. understand. So the team of vaccinators, their experience with um, vaccinating children as, as well as adults. So, um, yeah, they're, they're welcoming um, and warm and friendly face. OK, so hopefully that will encourage you. What percentage of children aged 5 to 11 have had severe COVID infection in Jersey? Do, do we have any figures for that? I mean, you, you kind of answered about there'd been a trickle of children who'd been to hospital. I guess that's severe enough to go into hospital, isn't it? Yeah, and severe COVID, by, by definition, would be sort of hospitalisation um, or more sort of needing, yeah, oxygen or respiratory support. I, I don't know if we do have those percentages, um, but, it, you know, there's no reason to think it would be any different to the UK or to the US uh, data and it's a small percentage I think they give a percentage of about 0.2% or, or in, in that region so we can assume it's around 0.2% because that's the kind of general percentage yeah. of children who get serious illness okay um, is the COVID vaccine for children still in clinical trial are my children part of an experiment Dr Muscat is it still in clinical trial the uh vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds um, has um, left clinical trials quite some time ago the same for 5 to 11 year olds um, I did mention earlier that the United States are undertaking a clinical trial in uh, six months to four year olds um, the vaccines therefore being used in Jersey are um, completely authorized they're outside a clinical trial by definition because they're fully authorized and absolutely no one uh, will uh, be uh, entered into a clinical trial without their full knowledge and their full consent. So, so uh, you know, that, that too needs to be borne in mind. So, no, they're not in a clinical trial. Will children having the vaccination reduce transmission to others from the children who've got the vaccine? If, if vaccine prevents infection, then it will prevent transmission from that person if they haven't got infection. So even although vaccine will have, can either prevent infection completely, in which case you can't get infection and therefore can't transmit it, or if you get infection despite being vaccinated, then you will have less severe disease. But in that case, uh, you may transmit it, although your period of infectivity will be reduced. So all in all, it does reduce transmission, but not completely. Okay. Do we know how many children aged 11 and under have died from COVID in the UK without having any comorbidities, other conditions? Do we know that I, figure? I haven't seen recent data, but yeah, I mean, there are small numbers without comorbidities. Um, I'm trying to think of any studies. The studies I saw sort of early, early in the, the pandemic, so I haven't seen any recently. I, I'm afraid I, I haven't got that data available. Neither have I. I think the, the number of children who die is quite small, and the proportion of children overall, overall mm -hmm. and the proportion who have died from COVID is about 20%. 10% of that order from what I recall but what I can't tell you is how many of that subgroup who died from COVID had no comorbidities I, I just don't have that probably, data I mean, that, that's probably not going to be in the general data is it there may well be some kind of study somewhere I'll, I'll have to look that up specifically I just yeah. don't have that data okay. I think there probably are some surveillance data on, on yeah, it, but, sure it, it's been 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 but it it would be small it would be small numbers but I wouldn't want my child to be to that, be that one, one if I could have done something to prevent it how long does the vaccine last in this age I heard it can start to wear off after weeks so is there even any point waning of immunity post vaccination <coughs> is faster in older people 
happen in younger people. Um, so uh, children will retain uh, immune protection for longer than uh, 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 old people. And uh, if you like, a reflection of that is the spring booster that is being given, uh, which is a fourth dose, which is being given now to the over 75s, even if they don't have comorbidities uh, or that put them into an immune suppressed group. Um, so um, that is a good sort of uh, example, practical example of, of how immunity wanes more quickly uh, in old people and therefore why they require boosters. The converse, the younger you are, the more you retain uh, a, a decent uh, immune protection of following vaccination. So how long does the, do we think immunity lasts generally for like for children, for middle-aged people, for <coughs> older people? Is there any kind of idea about that yet? I seem to remember hearing six months. It's probably longer than that and, and of course it is not just uh, um, the the protection against severe disease is uh, much more prolonged than protection against infection, and that holds for all age groups. But the waning of protection against infection and the waning of protection against severe disease is much slower in children, so much so uh, that at the moment uh, they are not being considered uh, for any boosters in the immediate future. Um, people are still uh, measuring the waning of immunity in that age group uh, and that will help determine when they require a booster. And we see the same happening with uh, people under the age of 75. They are not being entered into the spring booster system. They're being, uh, the, the, the waning of immunity is being studied to determine when to best next vaccinate them. Okay. Now, what are the panel's thoughts on the JCVI? It's JCVI, isn't it? Initially not recommending the vaccine for children and then performing a U-turn with their reason being avoiding disruption to children's lives. Do you have any views on that, Dr. Luck? Shall we hear what you think? Was that the reason they gave? Um, I, I think that was one of the main reasons they gave and I think there are a couple of reasons or a few reasons that may be behind the U-turn. I think one of them has been um, the fact that we've gained more data on giving the vaccine in younger and younger age groups so we're a bit more confident that it is a safe vaccine as many of the um, um, many of our, our questioners ha have put forward, you know, I think early days we knew it was a mild illness in children and, you know, there is a risk in any vaccine of side effects and I think everyone was very conscious of that in, um, before they made a recommendation. So we now have more data, so I think that's one of the reasons. I think one of the other reasons is as a, as a paediatrician and as a, as, as a mother, as a population, um, we've been speaking loudly about the fact that this is an adult disease but children are still suffering in different ways and actually the disruption to their education and all of those things and actually if by vaccinating that allows us to move forward then, then actually we've seen probably more effects on the disruption to education and all those things that our children haven't been able to enjoy and so I think those few factors, the, the risk-benefit balance has now swayed in favour of, yeah, let's vaccinate these kids, let's start getting, get, get, let them get on with having a normal life. Anything to add, Dr Muscat? Um, only that I wouldn't call it a U-turn. I'd say that at, at a particular point, uh, JCVI just did not have the data, to uh, enough data to recommend vaccination uh, universally. Uh, with time, they acquired that uh, data and therefore went on to recommend uh, vaccination. So it wasn't a U-turn as such. I think it was just a, 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 a journey along a straight line. They are now further down that line. Emma, you want to add anything? Um, I, I, I support what we've, what we've just been saying here this evening. Um, it's incredibly important to, um, to, to have the children vaccinated with, um, there's, there's, as time goes on, there's much more evidence that's available um, and there's now data to support that the vaccines are they're safe and effective um, and of good quality for our children. Okay, well, I think it's nearly time to finish. So before we do, we've only got about a minute to go. I just want to ask each of the panelists if they've got one thing that they'd like to kind of 
give people who are watching to, to take home with them to remember? What, what is the one thing you would like to say? Who wants to go first? Okay, <laughs> Dr. Luck, what, what would you really like to impress upon people? So, them? yeah, it's a, it's a mild, COVID is a mild illness in children, but we know that it can still have, um, have nasty effects and the vaccine is safe and the, the side effects of the vaccine are less than the effects of getting the virus itself. So, so get it. <laughs> I can only but repeat what Suzanne said, but in different words, the vaccine is safe, it is effective, it is all of a risk-benefit risk uh, balance, and it is very much in favour of vaccination, and vaccination has taken, out, taken us out of that horrible phase of COVID uh, into this pathway towards normality, so I would strongly recommend vaccination. Emma? Just following on from yourself, Ivan, um, vaccination has taken us into a completely different place um, where we're able to lead um, much more normal lives. Um, so encourage everybody to um, keep up with their vaccination schedules um, and appreciate that there's probably lots of island outs, uh, islanders out there who've still got lots of questions that we wasn't able to um, answer today. Um, but if there are any queries that anybody has, um, if you contact the helpline and they can get a message through to us and we can respond. And when you go to have your vaccinations, there are people there who can answer questions, aren't Absolutely, there? Whether you're, whether yeah, you're through, taking a child or getting your own vaccination. Through every step of the journey, from booking it on the website, there's um, lots of links to information, evidence-based information that's available there, to when you arrive at the vaccination centre with our experienced team that we have. Um, and then there's information leaflets as well to support that too. Okay, well, thanks very much to our panellists. Thanks to the people behind the scenes who've helped it happen today. And thanks very much for watching and asking questions. Good night.